I think the old phrase, political economy, is a very, very apt description of where South Africa finds itself in because a lot of the problems that we've had with governance, with leadership, with policy in direction, with shuffling around the finance ministry, we had three finance ministers in four days in December, have had a very adverse effect both on growth prospects, on currency depreciation, the RAND collapsed 31% against the dollar last year, and on investor confidence or lack thereof. And so South Africa is at a very, very difficult moment where it's staring down the barrel of a credit downgrade to sub-investment uh, rating. And that will simply mean that a lot of foreign funds will have to pull out of the country. Bear in mind that 37% of all uh, RAND denominated bonds are foreign held and most of those under their mandates will be obliged to withdraw if we lose our credit, uh, it's our sovereign credit rating. So it's had a very bad effect. And conversely, of course, I think politics, uh, better politics would have a very good effect. Uh, if I can just mention, I was in my previous life the ambassador of South Africa to Argentina. And Argentina is a much more extreme example than South Africa of bad governance and bad economics. They had a change of president in December when Mauricio Macri became president and suddenly Argentina has become an investor darling again. It's re-engaging with international credit markets and so on. So I do think particularly in developing market economies, political governance has a lot to do with economic prospects and vice versa. In more developed markets like the US, which you could also argue is very bad politics or sclerotic dysfunctional uh, presidential elections and so on, it doesn't really affect the market economy to the extent it does in a country like South Africa. I think there are a, a number of bright spots and I famously always, or I say, the famous brand of South Africa is resilience. So you really have an excellent private sector in South Africa which has withstood many challenges uh, under apartheid, under current economic uh, problems of the ANC government and powers on. And I, I think you can see that because South Africa has produced world-class companies that engage not just in South Africa but with the world. The uh, tie-up probably going to happen this year between AB InBev and SAB Miller is proof of that. The march of Steinhoff, huge retail company originating in South Africa across the high streets of Europe is another indicator of that. And the fact overall, in fact, that South African, most of the market or the leaderboard companies on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange uh, earn most of their revenues uh, in dollars or pounds indicates that they have really created with South African management and with South African origins global companies. So I think the South African private sector is very strong. I think it's very good. I also think uh, there's a lot of space inside the South African market because we talk, particularly at this conference, of the growth or the sustainability of the African middle class. The truth is most of the African middle class is actually in a country called South Africa. So notwithstanding a lot of the economic uh, challenges here, notwithstanding rising inflation and so forth, you've actually got a burgeoning middle class market in South Africa probably more sustainable than anywhere else on the continent and one of the brightest spots in the world. So, and that's why you have uh, interest by consumer companies. You see it repeatedly uh, in new openings in South Africa in the retail sector, notwithstanding some of the economic headwinds we face that you know, will open up major retail brands in South Africa, some extent manufacturing. I think the downside, of course, is the traditional South African economic bellwethers like mining. That's got challenges, but that's not where the money's going these days. I think the important emphasis in your question is evolving. So traditionally what's happened is Africa's been seen as a place where China extracted resources from and that powered along a lot of growth in countries like Zambia and up the west coast with oil exports and so on. And now you've seen that going sharply into reverse because the Chinese uh, economy is resetting there's uh, the spectre of recession looming in China and a lot of skittishness about the future growth trajectory of China. What has that meant? It's meant that Chinese uh, resource imports from Africa have cratered down about 40% last year or the first half of last year and we don't know the final figures but it'll probably be in that region as well. But what I've tried to emphasize at this conference is that there's a settled presence of China in Africa. So in addition to the bilateral trade, which is enormous, $220 billion a year, 
which is reducing, but it's still significant. You've got the, the settled presence of a million Chinese people living in Africa. And in countries like Ethiopia, which I recently visited, is quite extraordinary. You've got the signs in the airport are in Mandarin and in Ethiopian and in English. And you have uh, shoe manufacturing. They're, th they're saying like 20 Chinese companies employing 3,000 e Ethiopians exporting Chinese developed shoes using Ethiopian labor, Ethiopian raw materials into Europe and the United States are getting Ethiopian trade access, which is much better than China's, geographic access much closer than China's, and overall the um, bill is 27% lower for Chinese uh, manufacturers to manufacture in a country like Ethiopia than is in mainland China. So I think that's one example. I think you're seeing increasingly that happening in the service sector and elsewhere. So China and the Chinese are a big presence in Africa. I think it's mostly been favorable. There's a lot of controversy on the downside. You know, a lot of the bartering that was done, you give us your resources and we'll give you infrastructure. There have been a lot of complaints about what the infrastructure is like, uh, that it's pretty second rate, that in fact when Africa gets uh, a, an offer from the Chinese, it comes with a lot of conditionality, it comes with Chinese uh, labor rather than African labor. So the, I think a couple of African sovereigns have burnt their fingers, but that's entirely up to the sovereign as to what sort of deal they strike with the Chinese. I mean, the Chinese are in business and you can either strike a good deal or a bad deal. But I think overall it's, uh, it's a positive and it's an engagement, and I think it is now developing a depth that goes way beyond just, you know, short-term commodity flows. I think the obvious place for South Africa is its own neighbourhood, Africa. I mentioned in the talk I gave at this conference that intra-African trade is only 12% of total African trade. Now, there are a lot of South African retailers who've gone into the continent, uh, some have done very well. ShopRite Checkers, a South African originating company, is the largest grocery chain in the whole of Africa. Some have got their fingers burnt. We've had a lot of um, commercial disasters of South African companies going to very difficult jurisdictions like Angola. And coming out, you know, someone said investing in Angola for this particular entity means you go with a lot of money and you come back with a lot of experience. So it's not always a, a virtuous thing. But, um, and it's not because South Africans know more about Africa than people in Europe or America. It's because if you've developed product, if you've developed a market in South Africa, you're quite used to what are sometimes frontier conditions which uh, will replicate themselves elsewhere on the continent. And so um, not just having a base in Africa, but being familiar with some of the trading conditions has brought dividends. And, and, and I think you know, that, that's an obvious place that uh, South African companies need to go. But the world is very big and wide and open. And I do think that one of the consequences uh, of the fall of apartheid in South Africa 22 years ago and the opening up of the South African economy has meant that it's not just a restrictive uh, place, that we, our countries, our companies, go everywhere in the world. And um, I'm very excited, for example, about the opportunities which I exploited when I was South African ambassador in Argentina in a place like South America, which is very, very, uh, got some similar metrics to Africa in terms of its developing market potential, but it's not really exploited by South African companies. And you're interested in seeing a lot of South African companies going into South America, particularly in the retail sector, particularly in the hospitality sector. So I think, you know, there, there are a lot of places, there are a lot of opportunities.